Welcome back to the new broadcast on 24 Hours Channel. First and foremost, we would like to extend our greeting and well wishes to all our value listeners who have always accompanied and supported us along with our editorial team. We look forward to receiving your feedback and suggestion, which will further motivate us to deliver the best and most accurate information on the latest developments in the pandemic situation, national and international news, and the whole story of the past 24 hours. And now it's time for today's new update for you. Jeremy Stoner was born on July 16, 1980 in California. He had three siblings, two older brothers, Jason and Joshua, and one younger brother, Justin. They lived in Vallejo, California, a city with its own charm and beauty. Jason was a happy and playful child. He loved his family and his friends. He enjoyed going to school and learning new things. He liked to ride his bike, play with his toys, and watch cartoons. He had a bright smile and a big heart. On Saturday morning, February 21st, 1987, six-year-old Jeremy was playing outside with his two older brothers, aged 9 and 11, near their house. Jeremy and his brothers were being watched by a relative while their parents were at work. Their relative had to leave suddenly to take her sick daughter to the emergency room. The boys were told to stay home until their parents returned. Instead, they headed over to a neighbor's house. While there, a neighbor scolded Jeremy for a spilling ketchup, and they left. The boy's mother returned home at 4 p.m. to find the house empty, and she assumed the boys were playing at a neighbor's, as they often did. But when the two older boys returned without Jeremy two hours later, the family launched a search effort. With Jeremy nowhere to be seen, they called the police. Vallejo police quickly determined Jeremy had been kidnapped. The last sighting of him was believed to be at a Dairy Queen on Springs Road, about a five-minute walk from the family home. A worker there told investigators they saw Jeremy with an adult man around 7.30 that evening. Four days later, on February 25, 1987, Jeremy's body was found on Sherman Island in Sacramento County. Four people driving down Sherman Island Road in the Delta found themselves stuck in the mud. The driver got out to look for something to wedge under the tires. Instead, she discovered the body of a little boy. He had been assaulted, stabbed, and strangled. They called the police and told them about the discovery they made. Investigators arrived at the crime scene soon after. They collected all the evidence they could and stored it for future use. The news of Jeremy's demise spread quickly in Vallejo. The people were outraged and heartbroken by what happened to him. They felt sorry for his family and wanted to support them in any way they could. They gave them flowers, cards, and hugs. They searched for Jeremy when he was missing. They held a candlelight vigil for him. They also prayed for him and his family. The mayor of Vallejo at that time was Terry Curtola. He said that the people of Vallejo became part of the Stoner family for four days. He reiterated that they searched, cried, and prayed for him. It was not long until a suspect walked right into the Vallejo Police Department. About a week after Jeremy lost his life, an unemployed security guard named Sean Quincy Melton told police he may have information about the case. By his own admission, Melton said he wanted to impress detectives with his amateur investigation. He wanted, in his own words, to be a big shot. Video of his interrogation, though, showed the slow transformation of Melton from a swaggering sleuth to a bewildered crime suspect. He had a troubled past and a disturbing mindset, as evidenced by his authorship of a book titled The Wolf's Den, which depicted child exploitation. 
Although he claimed it was a work of fiction, some doubted that it was entirely detached from his own experiences. Sean Melton voluntarily visited the police station to provide information related to the case. He indicated that he had heard rumors and witnessed certain things that might aid in locating the perpetrator. However, the police held suspicions about his involvement in the crime. Their skepticism regarding Sean Melton was based on a legitimate reason. Before his visit, his psychologist had alerted the authorities and revealed that Sean Melton had confessed to having disturbing fantasies involving young boys. The psychologist expressed concerns that Sean Melton might pose a danger and could potentially be linked to Jeremy Stoner's case. The police subjected Sean Melton to an extensive 30-hour interrogation, during which they posed numerous questions and administered a polygraph test. They also created a sketch of him and compared it to a witness's description of the abductor. Their objective was to obtain information and potentially ascertain his involvement in the case. Sean Melton vehemently denied any involvement in the crime, asserting his innocence and claiming no knowledge of the case. He successfully passed the polygraph test, and the sketch of him did not match the witness's description. He maintained that his sole intention was to assist the police in solving the case. However, the police persisted in their pursuit of Sean Melton and put forward a new hypothesis. They alleged that Sean Melton suffered from multiple personality disorders and suggested that one of his alter egos named John Wolfe could have been the perpetrator. They contended that Sean Melton had no recollection of these actions. In response, the authorities arrested Sean Melton, charging him with kidnapping as well as taking Jeremy's life. Nevertheless, they lacked sufficient evidence to secure a conviction. Two trials were conducted, but on both occasions the juries could not reach a unanimous verdict. Consequently, the judge was compelled to dismiss the case. Sean Melton passed away in 2000 without ever admitting to any involvement in Jeremy Stoner's tragic fate. The case of Jeremy Stoner remained unsolved for many years, classified as a cold case due to the lack of progress and the absence of fresh leads or evidence. However, in 2023, a significant development occurred in Jeremy Stoner's case. The police received a new lead thanks to an advanced technology known as DNA testing. DNA, a unique genetic code present in every individual's body, can be instrumental in identifying a person or their familial connections. The police harnessed DNA testing to compare samples obtained from Jeremy's remains with those in a criminal database. This breakthrough held the promise of shedding new light on the long-standing mystery surrounding Jeremy's tragic fate. The police found a match. They finally found the perpetrator. The perpetrator's name is Fred Marion Kane III. 69-year-old Kane was arrested at his home in Central Point, Oregon. District Attorney Krishna Abrams said, I am so thankful to have such dedicated cold case investigators that no matter how much time goes by, they remain steadfast in their commitment to solving these horrific cases. Media reports from 1984 show Kane, then 30, was suspected of assaulting a 17-year-old in San Bernardino County. Kane and his roommate were arrested on suspicion of assaulting the teen at knife point. Kane was charged with forcible assault and use of a weapon, with enhancements for four previous prison terms, but was found not guilty by a jury later that year. The Solano County District Attorney's Office said it is not releasing further information due to the ongoing nature of the investigation, but Kane's arrest has likely drawn the attention of police in Martinez. Since the beginning, 
Jeremy's case was often mentioned in the same breath as that of Eric Coy. In late January 1987, just a month before Jeremy's disappearance, nine-year-old Eric went for a bike ride between his Martinez home and that of a relative's. Eric knew the route well and rode it often. He left home around 11 a.m. with the expectation he would call, as he always did, once he reached his relative's home a few blocks away. When he did not call home, a search was undertaken. His body was found close to Martinez Junior High School. He had been stabbed nearly a dozen times and succumbed to his injuries. To this day, Eric's case remains unsolved. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to call the District Attorney's Cold Case Unit at 707-784-8477. Kane made his first appearance in court in Solano County on September 28, 2023. The family of Jeremy Stoner was in the courtroom as Kane was brought in. Jeremy's mother, Karen Tabler, said, I do not know if it is relief. Not feeling good, that is for sure. She added that it was hard to be in the same room as Kane. Paul Secura, the chief deputy district attorney for Solano County, said, Well, I do not think you ever get closure. I have been around a long time. I have never seen families get true closure. But I feel like it will be some comfort that someone will be held responsible. Kerry Ann Cummings Kerry Ann Cummings was a 25-year-old transient from Eureka, California in 1997. Kerry was in a mental institution but decided to not get treated further. She did not want to go back to her family, even though they begged her to come to them. She informed her family that she decided to rather couch surf in Eugene, Oregon. That was the last time that they heard from her. Carrie's parents tried to reach her and went to the police to file a missing person case. They also hired a private investigator. Carrie's sister, Kathy, said that they were told that Carrie was an adult, that she had chosen the lifestyle, and that if she was not a threat to herself or others, there was nothing they could do. She also had the following to say about her attempts to find her sister through the years. As the internet expanded, I took to searching the Name Us website when I was missing her, scanning for mention of her tattoo and searching through the pictures of the Jane Doe's. She was dearly loved. In November 1998, a year after Carrie Ann went missing, Wayne Adam Ford entered a police station in Eureka, California with a Bible in his one hand and a woman's body part in a plastic bag in the other hand. He confessed to taking the life of four women, but he did not know any of their names. Three of his victims were identified. 26-year-old Tina Renee Gibbs. She was born on April 20th, 1972. Her life was taken on May 16, 1998, near Las Vegas. Her body was found on June 2nd near Buttonwillow, California. Lynette Dion White, 25 years old, of Fontana, executed on September 25, 1998 in Ontario, California, then dumped in an irrigation canal near Lodi. Patricia Ann Thomas, 29 years old. Her life was taken in Hesperia, and her body was found on October 23, 1998, in an aqueduct in San Bernardino. But one woman remained unknown. Investigators interviewed Ford and obtained descriptive details of the female. Ford's encampment was also searched as part of the investigation, and more body parts were found. Using DNA, the detectives were able to match the body part Ford brought in with a torso found by duck hunters north of Eureka in October 1997, the previous year. 
and the additional remains found by officials on Clam Beach in January 1998, nine months before as well as in his encampment. DNA samples were run through the California Missing Persons DNA Database and the National Unidentified Persons DNA Index, but no profile matches were ever made. Ford was sentenced to life imprisonment in June 2006, eight years later, and is currently serving that sentence at San Quentin State Prison in California. This is a very unusual case, as the detectives know who committed the crime, but not whom the victim is. In 2021, Sheriff William Hansel created a cold case unit which specifically reviewed Humboldt County Sheriff's Office unsolved cases for new leads. In December 2022, they partnered with a forensic genealogy lab called Othram to determine if advanced forensic DNA testing could help establish the identity of the unknown female or a close relative. Using a technique called forensic genome sequencing, the company was able to create a profile for who they thought may be a close relative by creating a family tree. At last, they found a match to a close relative of the unknown female. The detectives contacted the relative and she confirmed that she had a family member that went missing in the late 1990s. She then put them in contact with the sister, Kathy, of the missing person, Carrie Ann Cummings. Kathy provided investigators with a DNA sample, which was then compared to the DNA sample from the unknown female's remains. And finally, after 25 years, they identified the missing woman in 2023. Kathy had the following to say about her sister. Carrie was beautiful, funny, smart, and an artist. She was great at making us laugh. It is devastating what mental illness can do in a span of only two short years. Sheriff William Hansel commended his team by saying, While we cannot take away the pain of loss, we hope that this identification can help bring closure to Kerry's family and the community. I am thankful for the dedication of our investigators who never gave up on Kerry and continued to seek resolution for the outstanding cases that remain to be solved. The Humboldt County Coroner's Division is now in the process of releasing Carrie's remains so that she can be buried with the rest of the family. In the 80s, Catherine Spacito attended high school in Brooklyn, New York. After school, she relocated to Prescott, Arizona to attend Prescott College. She was an avid hiker and artist who had made many friends in her new home. On June 12, 1987, 23-year-old Kathy went out with her friends for dinner. She told them she planned to go hiking in the morning. The next day, June 13th at around 7 a.m., Kathy rode her mountain bike to the trailhead and began hiking up the path. The trail is in part of the Prescott National Forest, about 10 minutes outside of downtown Prescott. It is a popular hiking spot in the area. Shortly after Kathy took off, other hikers heard a woman's screams for help. The terrain is dense, which meant it took time for the other hikers to locate the woman in need. By the time they arrived, it was too late. Their gruesome finding was later identified as Kathy's lifeless body. One of the hikers called the police. Kathy's slaying rocked Prescott and Yavapai County as Thumb Butte Trail had always been seen as safe. The post-mortem stated that Kathy's demise was due to blunt force trauma to the right side of her head. This was the result of two rocks and a ratchet wrench that were found at the crime scene. Kathy was also shot in the face through her eye with a 22 caliber weapon. The bullet did not penetrate her brain. There was also a stab wound on the side of her head. The weapon and sharp item used to stab her were not found. The police started their investigation in their search for the offender. 
There were very little clues and no witnesses, which made it very difficult. Over the years, investigators said it is possible that there could be more than one perpetrator. Yavapai County Sheriff David Rhodes said, You have to keep all doors open. My team could be closer to reaching answers than ever before. I think if the case is solved that it will definitely be DNA that did it. Advancements in DNA testing like familial DNA could crack this case wide open. There was a reward of $10,000 being offered by Yavapai Silent Witness, an organization in Yavapai County and the state of Arizona, to help the flow of anonymous information in solving crimes. Kathy's older brother, Sal Spazito, flew in from New York to visit the crime scene with detectives. He asked that people come forward with any information. A high school classmate of Kathy wrote in an email to fellow alumni, I hope you will forgive the grim posting, but I am sharing it here in the interest of generating prayers and hopes for closure for one of our lost friends, Kathy Spacito. You may recall from past discussions here that Kathy was brutally slayed in 1987 and the case was never solved. The alum and her husband had visited Prescott the previous weekend. She wrote that while visiting Prescott, Kathy was on her mind. When the couple strolled out of one of the downtown shops, the classmate was stopped in her tracks by a large poster in the window with Kathy's photo. She realized that the police there continued to search for her offenders. She had a discussion with the shopkeeper, who told her some new leads have recently emerged and that have revived hope of solving the case. The alum also saw the same poster in a number of local windows throughout the town and found it pleasing to see that Kathy's memory and the quest for justice remained alive. She ended her email, I thought that you would want to know about it and to keep Kathy's soul and this case in your prayers. In 2021, Sheriff Rhodes said, 34 years is a long time, and many people have moved on with their lives, but our detectives and cold case investigators have not forgotten what happened to Kathy. They are actively working this case. We know someone has information on what happened to Kathy. We just hope they do the right thing and come forward. Kathy's brother said in an interview in 2021, you never want to give up hope. He remembered the day he heard the tragic news. It was shocking, something nobody wants to go through. This was no accident. Somebody with a lot of rage and anger wanted to put an end to her life. Sal Spazito said their dad passed away in 2010 without answers and their mother passed away a few years after that. He ended the interview by saying, I always said our mother passed away due to a broken heart because of what happened to Kathy. She took it the worst. At last, on August 25, 2023, Sheriff David Rhodes announced at a news conference that DNA evidence indicated the perpetrator in the case of Kathy Spacito. He was identified as Brian Scott Bennett. Sheriff Rhodes told reporters, I am saying today with high confidence, Kathy was slayed by Brian Scott Bennett. She was the victim of a serial predator who took his own life years later in 1994. Bennett would have been 53 years old now. He was a junior at Prescott High School at the time of Kathy's slaying. He was only 16 years old and had moved from Calvin, Kentucky to Prescott. He only spent a year and a half there before withdrawing from Prescott High School in 1988. After school, he was briefly in the Army before deserting in 1989. Bennett was convicted of forgery charges in 1991 and received three years probation. He was not convicted of any violent crimes according to the sheriff's office. Bennett served time in an Arizona prison for the forgery and became a fugitive in 1993. 
Investigators said that Kathy was Bennett's first victim. Authorities now believe he was also behind a 1990 assault of another woman in her 30s at the time. It happened on the same trail at the same time of day. In April 1990, she was camping with her boyfriend. She went for a hike. Within minutes, Bennett snuck up from behind and held a rock over her head while threatening to take her life. He attacked her before running off into the woods. The woman survived, and her name is being withheld for privacy reasons. Sheriff Rhodes continued the press conference and said that a DNA sample from the second attack on the same hiking trail ultimately led investigators to a family member of Bennett. This was in 2017, when advanced and more accessible DNA technology led investigators to link the DNA results to the second attack. They then worked backwards to Kathy's case. According to Sheriff Rhodes, the DNA was submitted to labs and a female descendant of Bennett was identified following a family tree analysis. The investigation led them to Kentucky and then to Bennett. To rule out a relative, authorities exhumed Bennett's body in November 2022 to obtain a complete DNA profile and positively matched it to the DNA profile from both attacks on the hiking trail. The familial forensic analysis continued. DNA was retrieved via cheek swabs taken from Bennett's brother and a daughter of Bennett. It was not until March 2023 that investigators confirmed DNA on a wrench used to take Kathy's life belonged to Bennett. He was accused of assaulting two other women, one at a party in Chino Valley in July 1990. The victim was reportedly drinking and went to lie down in a bedroom. However, Bennett followed the victim into the room and tried to assault her. Witnesses were able to break down the door and Bennett ran away. He was later arrested by the Chino Valley Police Department, but acquitted due to conflicting eyewitness testimonies. Sheriff Rhodes said Bennett's fourth victim is Renee Sandoval. On June 2, 1993, she was just leaving the post office in Prescott. Bennett forced her by knife point into her car and assaulted her multiple times. A police officer ultimately pulled the vehicle over for failure to dim headlights. This allowed Renee Sandoval to escape. Rhodes said she believed he was going to end her life. He had said to her, I cannot let you go because you have seen my face. Bennett was again arrested but never convicted due to discrepancies in the stories and lack of evidence. Renee Sandoval, who was 22 at the time of the kidnapping and assault, spoke during Friday's press briefing. She was emotional when she said, This is a long time coming. I want to start by saying, Thank you, God. I give you all the glory because he was with me that night. I prayed. He spoke to me. He is the reason that I am here today. She asked those listening to pray for all these people that have suffered a crime like this. Pray for those people who never had a voice. And today she is free. Kathy, you are free. There are so many emotions I cannot tell you. I cannot explain it all. Sandoval concluded, All the young people out there, watch yourself. Even older people, too. Be cautious of your surroundings. I tell my grandkids that all the time, and my mom. Cold case detectives were able to link the four separate victims, Kathy, Renee Sandoval, and the remaining two through new DNA analysis. Though Bennett will not be tried in the cases, Rhodes said it does not mean that it is any less significant. Rhodes also asked during Friday's press briefing, how could such an incredibly awful and atrocious thing happen in such a wonderful place? By releasing this news, authorities hope to determine whether there were other victims in addition to Kathy and the three other women. Rhodes said investigators believe there may be more than four victims linked to the suspect. He continued, 
What we know of serious, violent predators like this is that it is very unlikely, given the frequency in which he was willing to act, that these are the only four cases that exist. Sheriff Rhodes also said, The other role here is exactly what happened is that we are giving voice back to the survivors. You are giving answers back to the survivors. You are giving answers back to the community. Through the work of dedicated volunteers, numerous detectives and the many partners who gave their time and their hearts to solving these cold cases, four women were given either closure, peace, or validation today. Prescott Mayor Phil Good, who attended the press conference, said, Advancements in DNA, both direct and familial, allow for a closure for everyone involved in cold cases such as Kathy Sposito. With such information available nowadays, there is a good chance you get a knock on the door that justice has been served. Susan Robin Bender was born on November 27, 1970 in Modesto, California, as the only child of Patricia Chupka Bender. On April 25, 1986, Susan, then 15 years old, left her family home to visit friends in Carmel-by-the-Sea for the weekend. She walked to the Greyhound bus station on 10th Street and G Street. While waiting for the bus, Susan ran into friends. She told them about her excursion to the coast and that she planned to be back in a few days. After their conversation was ended, Susan made a call at the depot payphone. About 10 minutes later, a full-sized olive green 1977 Ford van pulled up. Susan got into the vehicle. This was the last time that Susan was seen. She had a lot of freedom for a 15-year-old, which was not terribly uncommon in the 1980s. Pat Bender, Susan's mother, assumed that Susan had safely made it to Carmel, and was having fun with her friends. When Susan failed to call home as she usually did, her mother became worried. She reported her daughter missing on May 1, 1986. Detectives soon came to the conclusion that something terrible had happened to Susan. One detective told the local newspaper, We have certain evidence to indicate foul play was involved in the disappearance of Susan Bender. Susan's mother told the same newspaper that Susan had run away twice before, but each time she had returned home in fairly short order. She said, Everything had been good between us for a couple of months before she disappeared. There was no indication that she was going to run away. She added that an unnamed male person of interest had been found with Susan's diary, phone book, and clothing in his possession. Pat continued, I am afraid she was attacked by a man the police questioned but never arrested. They did not arrest him even though they had a lot of circumstantial evidence against him. Police always believed Susan was not missing of her own volition. Detective Richard Reidenauer, who was assigned to the case until his retirement in 2000, told a newspaper in 1987 that he thought Susan was most likely not alive anymore. In 1999, Susan's mother said in an interview, The police said there is little they can do without a body. Detective Reidenauer commented in that same year, Susan Bender just fell off the face of the earth. What is really strange about this case is that nothing has ever come up about her in all these years, and no one has ever come forward with any information about what happened to her. Also in 1999, Lauren Herzog and Wesley Shermantine, two childhood friends from Linden, California, targeted young women in and around the nearby Stockton area. There was some speculation that perhaps Susan was one of their victims. Many of their victims have never been identified. Authorities did not know if the men had anything to do with Susan's abduction, but it is possible as she vanished in the time that they were busy with their evil deeds. Susan's disappearance fit their modus operandi for victims. 
But despite years of investigation into Herzog and Shermantine's crimes, there had never been a link to Susan's case. They went on a spree in the 1980s and 1990s. They took the lives of several females and may have had more than 15 victims. In the meantime, Susan's case remained unsolved. For nearly four decades, investigators spoke to family and friends who fought to keep Susan's story alive. Sandy Silveria, a friend of Susan, commented in 2021, Where is she? What happened to her? Whoever did this, they have to be held accountable. In October 2021, the Modesto Police Department announced that they reopened the case in the hopes of finally locating the long-lost teenager. The department said in a statement, In reviewing this case, we identified potential areas of opportunity which may assist in moving this case forward. This includes the use of advancements in technology. Given the circumstances of the crime, we also believe there may be individuals, previously unidentified, who may have pertinent information surrounding Susan's disappearance. Modesto's cold case investigators were hoping that the many years since Susan's disappearance had increased witnesses' willingness to speak out. The police department said in a statement in 2022, It is important to remember that Susan was a child with a family. Unfortunately, that family has gone 36 years without closure or justice. It is our job as an agency to assist in providing some level of closure with the ultimate goal of getting justice. Then, on Thursday, August 17, 2023, the Modesto Police Department announced the arrest of Raymond Lewis Stafford. He is 76 years old. Stafford was arrested on August 15th in Wills Point, 50 miles east of Dallas, where he had been living for around five years. Stafford appeared to be hiding in plain sight for decades. Detectives got an arrest warrant on August 10th, but it was not until Tuesday that members of the Van Zandt County Sheriff's Department in Texas showed up at his home and took him into custody. He was arrested without incident and subsequently booked into the Van Zandt County Jail and charged with taking Susan's life. Modesto police did not give further details about what they believe happened to Susan. Stafford is currently incarcerated in Texas, awaiting extradition to California. Exactly how detectives zeroed in on Stafford as a suspect has not been detailed. Modesto police are differing questions to the Stanislaus County District Attorney's Office, saying there was no other information they could release. Newspapers and local radio stations did reach out to the Modesto Police Department and Stanislaus County District Attorney to learn what led to the suspect's arrest, but did not receive a response. No information was released about how exactly Susan might have met her end, whether there is any chance of recovering her body, or what new evidence resulted in the charges against Stafford. In a news release, Modesto police expressed their gratitude to the Stanislaus County District Attorney's Office, the California Department of Justice, and various Texas authorities for their help in the long and challenging investigation. It said, the collaborative efforts of these agencies have been instrumental in bringing closure to Susan Robin Bender's case. As detectives suspected foul play right from the start, they had a suspect nearly from the start. According to court records filed in Stanislaus County, investigators at the time traced the green van to Stafford after he was arrested on suspicion of an unrelated burglary a month after Susan vanished. He had not been publicly named at the time. In the course of their investigation, they learned that Stafford had briefly worked with Susan's mother, Patricia Bender. At the time, she said that she believed Stafford may have formed a relationship with her daughter after calling their home phone. 
Court documents showed that Pat worked for Stafford for a few days back in 1985 at his security business. They also said she admitted to dating Stafford on a few occasions. Thus, Stafford was well known to Susan. It was his rental van which Susan had been seen getting into at the bus stop. She got into his van without hesitation, according to her friend, who witnessed everything at the day of her disappearance at the bus station. A woman who lived with Stafford in the 1980s said he confessed that he strangled a female with a cord or wire and buried her near the Big Oak flat entrance to Yosemite. He said, according to court records obtained, that he drove to a campground near the Big Oak Flat entrance to Yosemite National Park and dug the grave. Less than a year after Susan disappeared, Stafford, then 38, ran for Modesto City Council. He was asked by the local newspaper about his criminal record, but told the paper in July 1985 it was a result of him being in the wrong place at the wrong time. His arrests were listed as operating an unlicensed private investigator business and carrying a badge saying he was a private investigator. Stafford said that his campaign was focused on policies to protect children from predators. He added, We do not spend any time getting the people who are harassing our children. Unsurprisingly, he lost the election. Five months later, in December 1986, Stafford was convicted of setting a business on fire and pled guilty to making a false police report. He reportedly faked a kidnapping to avoid appearing in court. In 1994, he emerged once again on law enforcement's radar. He was put on an offender's register under the alias Greg Tunningly, for abusing a 13-year-old girl in California. New court records identified the man as Stafford. Pat revealed she always suspected Stafford was behind her daughter's disappearance after she discovered the pair had carried on a secret relationship. Pat said, I have known, I have known from the start. When my daughter came up missing, I have known that he was the person responsible. The investigators did not listen to me, Pat added, that that thought had lived with her for the past 37 years. She continued, It was like I was lost. Honestly, it was like I was the walking deceased woman. It hurt when I heard people talking about their grandkids and their kids. Pat said the memories of her 15-year-old daughter were what kept her going. She remembered, Susan was outgoing. She was funny. She was just an average teenager, just trying to figure out where she fits. Pat never lost hope, but the quest to find her daughter was agonizing until now. She said she has had to lean on her faith. She stated, I'm grateful. I'm glad that the system has finally decided to step up and do something instead of have me wondering. Those closest to Susan hope to learn where she is in hopes of giving her the farewell they always felt she deserved. Now in the final act, her mother says the one thing she has never wrestled with is forgiveness toward Stafford. I know this is going to sound kind of strange, but I have forgiven him for what he did to my daughter. I really have, because I would not want to carry that with me for the rest of my life. Pat said this arrest has lifted a dark cloud from her shoulders. Now I am not looking forward to how the trial will play out. I just want Susan's body found. She concluded, My message is a simple one. Start listening to your kids. Sarah Ashley Hill was a 33-year-old mother of two who worked as a waitress at a local diner in Patrick County, Virginia in 2018. She was known for her cheerful smile, her kindness, and her love for music and dancing. She had a close relationship with her sister April, who often helped her with her children. 
Sarah was one of five siblings and the only one with that pretty red hair and bright blue eyes. Her siblings used to tease her and tell her she was adopted. In June 2018, Sarah was staying with her friends in North Carolina. At 1.30 a.m. on June 6, she called April on her cell phone and told her she was near Mount Airy on Blue Hollow Road and needed a ride. Sarah did not explain why she was walking at that time of the morning. April was at work almost an hour away and could not just leave. She was a registered nurse at U. Chatham Memorial Hospital in Elkin. By the time the family arrived in Mount Airy, Sarah Hill was nowhere to be found. They assumed she had gotten a ride elsewhere, or maybe found a way to access her own car, a white 2000 Ford Taurus. The next day, April sent Sarah a text to see if she was okay, and if she still needed a ride. April got no reply. April called again, and messages went to voicemail. After two weeks, Sarah's phone had been turned off. It was very unusual for Sarah to be out of contact, according to April. They talked at least once a week, sometimes more often. April noted that Sarah was addicted to illegal substances and was friends with a lot of shady people. April wondered if it played a role in her sister's disappearance. A month after Sarah was last seen, she was finally reported missing. Detectives immediately started investigating. After her disappearance, her white Ford Taurus turned up at a store on NC-89 near the Blue Hollow Road intersection. It was caught on video footage the store owner obtained while trying to catch shoplifters, but Sarah was not identified among any of the individuals suspected of wrongdoing there. The police searched the car and found Sarah's purse, phone, keys, and some personal items inside. However, they did not find any fingerprints, DNA, or other clues that could link anyone to her disappearance. The police considered all possible scenarios for Sarah's disappearance. They investigated if she had any enemies or problems with anyone who might have harmed her. They checked if she had any debts or financial troubles that might have driven her to run away. Investigators also looked into whether she had any history of mental illness or substance abuse that might have affected her judgment or behavior. They explored if she had any romantic affairs or domestic disputes that might have led to violence or jealousy. However, they did not find any evidence to support any of these theories. During the investigation in January 2019, the Surrey County Sheriff's Office checked several locations throughout the county, which included three different properties on King Park Circle, Mount Airy, North Carolina. In retracing Sarah's last known steps, investigators believed she was in a location in nearby Stokes County where she had been hanging out with a guy. This person of interest acted suspiciously, including refusing access to his home. It was discovered that the man had previously been charged with assault. In 2022, they were led to an Ashbury Road property in Stokes County, North Carolina, where Sarah was last seen at the time of her disappearance. On Monday, October 17, 2022, the Surrey County Sheriff's Office, in conjunction with the Stokes County Sheriff's Office and the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, executed a search warrant for the property of 1791 Asbury Road, Westfield, North Carolina. Detectives brought in specialized personnel to utilize heavy equipment to move dirt and terrain and stabilize an existing structure. Human remains were located beneath the floorboards. The remains were sent to Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. On October 20, 2022, 
An autopsy was performed and confirmed that the remains were of Sarah Ashley Hill. On October 11, 2023, the Stokes County Sheriff's Office announced that Leroy Hoover had been arrested and charged with taking Sarah's life. Hoover is currently in the Stokes County Jail with no bond awaiting trial. He has other cases also pending in Stokes County. Sheriff Joey Lemon said, We can only imagine how hard this has been for the family of Ms. Hill. Investigators from the Patrick County Sheriff's Office, Surrey County Sheriff's Office, Stokes County Sheriff's Office, as well as the NCSBI agents who worked on this case have done a tremendous job, and they never gave up. Although nothing will bring a loved one back, we can only hope this helps provide some closure to Ms. Hill's family. 29-year-old Teresa Scalf was a kind and caring nurse who worked at Lakeland Regional Health in Florida in 1986. She loved helping people and taking care of her son, Jason, who was eight years old. Jason was her only family, as she was a single mom who lived by herself with him in a small apartment. Teresa had brown hair and green eyes, and she always wore a smile on her face. She was a friendly and cheerful person who had many friends at work and in her neighborhood. She enjoyed spending time with her son, reading books, and watching movies. She also liked to travel and learn new things. She had a dream of becoming a doctor someday and saving more lives. One night, on October 15, 1986, when Jason was staying with his grandma Betty, Teresa was alone in her apartment. It was a dark and stormy night, and the rain was pouring down. An unknown man broke into her home. He had a knife, and he wanted to harm Teresa. He had left his fingerprints on the doorknob and the windowsill. He had also left his DNA on a cigarette butt that he had discarded on the floor. He assaulted Teresa with his knife and attempted to force himself on her. Teresa fought back with all her strength. She tried to protect herself with her hands, but he injured them severely. He was stronger than her, and he inflicted a severe injury on her throat. He ended her life and left her body on the floor. He fled from the apartment. The next morning, when Teresa did not show up to work, her mom, Betty, became concerned and went to see her. She found Teresa's body in a pool of blood. She called the police and they arrived at the apartment. They collected all of the evidentiary items from the crime scene and stored them to be used later. Plenty of suspects were interviewed and leads were followed but investigators could not identify the perpetrator and the case went cold. Finally, on October 16, 2023, Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd announced that the case had been solved. They were able to confirm that Donald Douglas was responsible for what happened to Teresa. Douglas was 33 years old at the time of the crime. He co-owned an electrical company with his brother. Douglas passed away due to natural causes in 2008 at the age of 54. Douglas had no past criminal record and was also cremated after his passing, which made connecting him to the case all the more difficult. Teresa's mother, Betty Scalf and two of Teresa's sisters joined Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd for a news conference, as Judd described how his agency solved the 37-year-old case. Sheriff Judd said that Douglas lived just behind the duplex, and investigators interviewed him and other neighbors at the time but never considered him a suspect. Judd said detectives originally investigating the case had seen no wounds on Douglas and had no reason to suspect him. Judd speculated that Douglas took Teresa's life because he sought a relationship with her and she rebuffed him. 
Judd explained that as technology advanced, the agency and her DNA taken from the crime scene into the FBI's national database in the early 2000s, but found no matches, meaning the perpetrator's DNA had not been entered. Judd credited Detective Matthew Newbold with leading the effort to resolve the case after receiving it in 2015. Newbold kept a photo of Teresa Scalf on his desk and vowed to her family that he would not retire until he had identified the perpetrator. Newbold worked with Othram, a Texas company that specializes in developing genetic samples from crime scene evidence. Using publicly available DNA that people submit through such programs as 23andMe, the company helped create a family tree for the suspect. One hit landed on a third cousin of Douglas who had conceived a baby outside of marriage in 1949. What Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd described as the illicit affair ultimately exposed a new family tree branch. David Nutting, a company representative for Othram, said it was the 106 publicly announced solution to an unsolved case through Othram's DNA research. He said there are an estimated 330,000 unsolved cases in the United States. After identifying Douglas as the perpetrator, sheriff's investigators contacted his son and asked for a DNA sample. He fully cooperated, Judd said, and was mortified to learn that his sample confirmed that Donald Douglas's blood had been found at the crime scene. Pam Shade, Teresa's sister, said, The first thing that I would like to say is Teresa was a wonderful person, the most loving person. She did not deserve it. Our family did not deserve this. She added, She started off at the bottom, nursing assistant, she went to respiratory school. She got her RN and was so proud. I've never seen anyone more proud. She said, I did it, Pam. I did it. And she lost her life a month later, after we had this conversation. I hope it gives everybody comfort to know that we now know who did this. I also would like to offer encouragement to other victims. Do not give up. Law enforcement do not give up. And as long as they do not give up, you do not give up. Teresa's other sister, Lynn Scaff, said that Teresa shared that she had some uncomfortable experiences with a neighbor, but did not fully describe him, offering that up as a cautionary tale for present-day stalking victims. Teresa had told us about some creepy neighbor that had showed up at her house with what looked like he had yanked a flower up out of the ground and slapped it into a pot. He was sort of stalkerish, and she had told us about him, but she never described him. So anybody, but especially ladies, if someone is being creepy, do not just tell your sisters, tell them what he looks like. When Betty Scaff took to the microphone, she said, All I want to say is, I am 84 years old. I live to see this done. I think that is why I lived so long. 17-year-old Gladys Ariano lived in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles in 1996. She was beautiful, intelligent, and had big dreams for her life. Gladys was last seen on January 28, 1996, leaving her home. When she failed to return home later in the day, she was reported missing by her family. Two days later, her body was found off a main road in a ravine in Topanga Canyon. She had been assaulted and strangled. Serology evidence was collected from her body and a DNA profile of the unknown offender was uploaded to the state and federal DNA databases, but a match could not be found. An extensive investigation was completed by the investigators at the time, but it led nowhere and the case went cold. 
That was until 2019. Los Angeles police arrested a man by the name of Jose Luis Garcia for domestic assault. During the booking process, DNA swabs were taken from Garcia and processed. Investigators then realized that his DNA matched the DNA that was taken from Gladys's body. Detectives visited Garcia and questioned him about Gladys. The crime took place when he was just 19 years old. They obtained a second DNA swab from him. The Los Angeles Crime Lab was then able to confirm that Garcia's genetic profile matched the unidentified sample taken from Gladys's body in 1996. 43-year-old Jose Luis Garcia was arrested by U.S. Marshals on September 29, 2019, in Dallas, Texas. He was extradited on October 14 to Los Angeles County, where he was held on a $1 million bail. Detective Hugo Renaga said, This case is typical of the type of cases that the unsolved detectives are faced with on a daily basis. We are gratified that we are successful in bringing this tragic case to a close. Reynaga confirmed that investigators were looking into the possibility that Garcia was involved in other crimes as well. Gladys's niece and goddaughter, Samantha Moreno, spoke movingly of the need to remember her godmother, as well as all other women who were victims of violence. Recognizing her life is important. Beautiful Latina souls from Boyle Heights should never be forgotten, Moreno said. Acts of violence against women should never be forgotten. Samantha Moreno thanked the detectives who never lost sight of finding justice. Gladys Ariano's case was worked on by retired detectives Joe Purcell and Sean McCarthy who both work part-time on the Sheriff's Department's Unsolved Case Unit. Thank you for not giving up on our Gladys, who was a loving daughter, sister, aunt, and godmother. Gladys was only 17 when her life was taken. She had a beautiful soul. She was beautiful, intelligent, gorgeous, and she had a radiant smile. She had such big dreams for her life. My grandparents would have been so proud of her. Moreno said she was grateful Garcia was off the streets after nearly a quarter century. We want nothing more than for him to pay for his brutal crime, she said. We recognize that this will not bring Gladys back, but we are relieved to know that there will be justice for Gladys. This is a victory that we acknowledge in her honor and we look forward to more victories. Jose Luis Garcia was found guilty of all the charges against him on July 18, 2023. It was a day the loved ones of Gladys Ariano had been waiting decades for. It is never enough for having taken a life of such a beautiful soul, said Elizabeth Ariano of her sister Gladys. Gladys Ariano's sister and best friend told the court what Garcia did nearly destroyed them, as they wondered for more than 25 years what happened to her. It was tough, but it felt really good to finally get it off your chest and actually, like, seeing him and, you know, releasing it. And having some kind of comfort, said Vanessa Ariano, Gladys Ariano's younger sister. Janet Ramirez, Gladys Ariano's close friend, said the plea deal gives her some comfort, but it is not enough. Nineteen years is never enough, but I have comfort knowing now she can rest, that the perpetrator is going to be behind bars, because for twenty-five years I've lived with the guilt of not knowing what I could have done different, Ramirez said. Jose Garcia was sentenced on August 15, 2023 to 18 years and 8 months in prison for taking Gladys's life. Garcia pleaded no contest to voluntary manslaughter, kidnapping and domestic assault, according to the district attorney's office. 
He waived his credit for the just over 1,000 days he has spent in jail since his 2020 arrest. Retired Sheriff's Detective Joe Purcell handled the cold case investigation. The fact is that we can give justice to people and to society. It is really important not to let these cases go unresolved. We need to have people pay the debt they owe to society, he said. Twenty-three-year-old Laura Kempton lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 1981. She was a student at the Portsmouth Beauty School and was employed at the Macro Polo gift store and Karen's Ice Cream Parlor. Laura was known to be an outgoing free spirit with a big personality and was particularly social. Laura was last seen entering her Chapel Street apartment alone during the early morning hours of September 28, 1981. A police officer attempting to serve a court summons related to unpaid parking tickets found Laura's body a few hours later. As the officer made his way up to the residence, he noticed a wooden panel piece on the front door was missing. Through the small opening, he could see Laura's body lying on the floor just inside the apartment. An autopsy showed that her life was taken shortly after entering her apartment. She suffered massive trauma to the left side of her head. Laura had incurred multiple skull fractures as well as lacerations and contusions on her brain. She had also been assaulted which meant DNA could be collected from her body. Investigators collected other evidentiary items from the crime scene as well and stored it to be used later. They interviewed other residents in Laura's apartment complex but gathered no useful information. The case sadly went cold. In 1986, investigators revealed that they questioned Ronald Spiewak about Laura's slaying. He took the lives of two other women in Boston, Massachusetts. Spiewak denied involvement, but Portsmouth police were purportedly monitoring his case. In taking a closer look at the crimes he was charged with, the only blatant association is that Ronald Spiewak hailed from a city in New Hampshire roughly 45 minutes from Portsmouth, hardly a smoking gun. Spiewak had picked up his victims, Gina Quarnier and Kathleen McGuire, on two separate occasions in Boston. Though he eventually confessed to ending their lives, Spiewak contended that in both instances, each of them had pulled a knife on him demanding additional payment for their services. He claimed he only acted in self-defense. Spiwak strangled both women and dumped their bodies elsewhere. Gina's in an abandoned railway car in South Boston, and Kathleen's along the driveway of a tourist information booth on Interstate 95 in Kittery, Maine. No real ties to Laura's case were ever identified. In 1998, two Portsmouth detectives attending a conference in Florida listened intently as an investigator with the Naval Investigative Service presented the unprosecuted case of Dina Kitchler. Dina had been assaulted and strangled with a rope in her home in Mayport, Florida in December of 1990. Signs of an intense struggle and clumps of Dina's long, dark hair were present all over the house, a large portion having been cut off in her bathtub. Dina's husband, a naval officer, had been deployed at the time of the crime. Portsmouth Police Captain James Tucker could not believe what he was hearing. The similarity of Dina's case to the slaying of a New Hampshire woman, Michelle LaFond, was astonishing. And better yet, authorities had already arrested a man by the name of John Brewer in connection with Dina's case. Regrettably, he had been released from custody shortly after his arrest as authorities lacked sufficient physical evidence. 
But as new details emerged in regards to the Dublin, New Hampshire case of Michelle Lafond, John Brewer found himself back in custody before long. Portsmouth investigators were able to pinpoint a definitive link between Brewer and Michelle Lafond. In searching through records, James Tucker located a job application that John Brewer had filled out, listing Michelle's husband, Gary, as a reference. Police matched DNA from hairs collected in the Kitchler case to DNA taken from a DNA sample in the LaFond case, and John Brewer was arraigned and charged for both cases. News of the indictment swept the Granite State, and it was reported that Brewer had been linked to three other cases, two in Portsmouth and one in Florida. It appeared that Brewer was living in New Hampshire at the time that Laura Kempton's life was ended, but his modus operandi proved perceptibly divergent. No real correlations were ever made. Perhaps it was just a hasty assumption due to the fact that the detectives who had brought Brewer to justice were from Portsmouth. Other rumors swirling among the small seacoast town pinned what happened to Laura on a couple of young men in the area known to be violent drug suppliers. Previously gracing the pages of the police logs with more minor offenses, members of the operation led by a Portsmouth local, Thomas Faraghi, had escalated to far more intemperate crimes. Faraghi in particular had been arrested for assaulting several women, Eventually, he was indicted in March of 1982 for fatally shooting 24-year-old Valerie Blair in the neighboring town of Rye. Blair was found in Audiorn State Park, having been shot five times in the head and face with a 22 caliber pistol. Thomas Faraghi was incarcerated for decades but maintained his innocence. He blamed what happened to Valerie Blair on one of his cohorts, who he states must have stolen his firearm. In an interview, Faraghi asserted he believed the same man took Laura Kempton's life. Faraghi said that Laura was a customer of theirs, and his friend became upset when he saw her kissing someone in her apartment while they were there conducting a transaction. Interestingly, Faraghi's girlfriend in 1982 was enrolled at the Portsmouth Beauty School, where Laura Kempton was enrolled as well. Faraghi's DNA was collected, but he was never charged with any additional crimes. The man Thomas Faraghi blamed for Laura's case was looked at by police and cleared. The next major update came on July 20th, 2023. It was then that investigators announced Laura's case was finally solved after 42 years. Investigators identified the man responsible as Ronnie James Lee, who was 21 at the time. Officials said Lee lived and worked in Portsmouth. Assistant Attorney General Rachel Harrington said, There is no indication that he knew or was acquainted with Laura Kempton. Lee served in the U.S. Army until May 15, 1981, and then worked for MBI Security at Liberty Mutual in Portsmouth from June 1981 to August 1982. Lee used his mother's address on Rock Hill Avenue in Portsmouth when he was arrested by Portsmouth police on November 8, 1982 on an attempted theft charge. Lee's criminal history includes being linked to four residential burglaries and one commercial burglary in 1983, including two burglaries he pleaded guilty to. In 1987, Lee was convicted of charges stemming from a burglary in Keene, New Hampshire, that included the assault of a woman in that home. He was sentenced to prison, where he was held from December 1987 to July 1990. 
Lee lost his life on February 9, 2005, at the age of 45, after he overdosed. Officials with the Attorney General's office said, if Lee were alive, he would face first-degree charges for knowingly ending Laura's life during the commission or attempted commission of aggravated felonious assault, and alternatively for striking her with a blunt object, which was believed to be a wine bottle. Investigators said they were able to identify Lee through genetic genealogy techniques. They said physical evidence collected from the scene in 1981 revealed, after forensic analysis done decades later, a male DNA profile. Beginning in 2022, officials said Portsmouth Police worked in conjunction with the New Hampshire State Police Forensic Laboratory, the Maine State Police Forensic Laboratory, the Attorney General's Cold Case Unit, and Genetic Genealogy Research Organization Identifiers International to conduct forensic genetic genealogy to identify the contributor of the DNA found at the crime scene as Lee. Because Lee is not alive anymore, the case is considered closed and solved. Laura's family released a statement about the case being solved. The Kempton family wishes to express our deepest gratitude to the Portsmouth Police Department for solving Laura's case. Their diligence and determination, along with extraordinary personal commitment of the past decades, have led to this moment for Laura. The family would like to acknowledge retired Captain John Paracci, Portsmouth Police Department Investigative Division, and his team members past and present who have worked tirelessly on Laura's case. Their extraordinary efforts have led to this important moment today. Many, many other hands have touched Laura's file over the past 41 years, and the family expresses our deepest gratitude to all who contributed. The Kempton family would like to request privacy at this time as we process this information. Thank you all. In the past, law enforcement officials have said Laura's case and the demise of Tammy Little in Portsmouth in 1982 were potentially connected. When asked about Tammy's case, Attorney General John Formella said it is still being investigated. The little case remains under investigation, Formella said. It is our hope that what we are announcing today may give us some additional information about that case. It was Tuesday, October 19, 1982, and nobody had heard from Tammy Little over the course of a couple of days. The 20-year-old Portsmouth Beauty School student was last seen by friends who dropped her off at her home after a night out over the weekend. Though she lived alone, the sociable young woman would never intentionally make herself unreachable for such a long period of time. When she had not surfaced, it was clear that something was discernibly wrong. Tammy's mother was justifiably concerned. She decided to look in on her daughter at her Maplewood Avenue apartment. What she encountered that October day in 1982 was utterly scarring. Her child's lifeless body in her home, and she had been beaten ferociously. Authorities swarmed 315 Maplewood Avenue to process the case after Tammy's mother called them. Investigators collected physical evidence from the home and interviewed nearby neighbors. An autopsy was performed the following day, revealing that Tammy had succumbed to massive head injuries, having been viciously bludgeoned. In the coming days and months, as Tammy's family and friends mourned her monumental loss, the remainder of the city was left in a state of heightened distress. The fears of many residents had seemingly been confirmed, and an air of trepidation shrouded the community. It had happened again. Another girl, 
another crime, no arrest. The similarities between Laura and Tammy's cases are striking, but the two women share much more in common than the way in which their lives ended. Both Tammy and Laura lived alone in ground-level apartments in Portsmouth and attended the Portsmouth Beauty School. They had been aspiring models, having photographs taken in hopes of acquiring work. Both women were outgoing and frequented a couple of the same bars downtown, and they lost their lives in the early morning hours of a weekend day in the fall. They lived just a mile from one another. The hope is that DNA will soon reveal whether Ronnie James Lee is responsible for taking Tammy Little's life as well. Twenty-three-year-old Cheryl Monique Taylor lived in Weldon, North Carolina in 2002. She was married to high school sweetheart John Osby. They had a seven-year-old daughter named Justice. Justice woke up on the morning of August 16, 2002, and realized that Cheryl had not waken her up in time for the school bus, and she missed it. Justice went to her mom's bedroom, and it was there that she discovered that someone had taken Cheryl's life. An autopsy showed that she had been strangled and presumably assaulted. It was not made public if there were signs of forced entry, or if investigators were able to collect forensic evidence from the crime scene that belonged to the perpetrator. Despite an extensive investigation by authorities, no arrests were made and the case went cold. Justice and John grieved together for 17 more years. Then came December 2019. After going missing, John Osby was found fatally shot and rolled up in a blanket near Sycamore Street in Weldon. Investigators were unable to track down the person that shot him. And for years, the family was left wondering if they would ever get answers to what happened to John and Cheryl Taylor. That changed when Sheriff Tyree Davis hired Detective Sergeant Samoji as Halifax County's dedicated cold case investigator in January 2023. His job was to pore over the office's unsolved cold cases looking for anything that investigators may have missed in the past, and using new technology to find clues that were out of reach before. Detective Samoji first looked into John Osby's case, before realizing Cheryl's life had been taken by someone years earlier. He identified the person responsible for what happened to Cheryl. Finally, on July 21, 2023, 46-year-old Lewis Turner Jr. was arrested and charged with taking Cheryl Taylor's life. He was living in Northampton County, North Carolina. It is not known yet if he is responsible for shooting John Osby. It was revealed that Turner was a friend of Cheryl and her family back in 2002 when he took her life. Turner was 25 years old when the crime took place. He has two other criminal charges on his record, assaults from when he was a teen. In both those cases, he got probation. After being arrested and charged with voluntary manslaughter, Turner was held at the Halifax County Jail under $250,000 bond. Scott Hall, patrol captain of the Halifax County Sheriff's Office, outlined the reasoning behind the voluntary manslaughter charge. This was not a premeditated crime with malice. Based on the facts of the case and elements of the crime, we charged accordingly. Sheriff Tyree Davis remarked how he cried tears of joy at being able to arrest a suspect in connection with Cheryl's case. I received the call that we were able to solve one of our cold cases, a cold case from over 20 years ago. No one knew about this information and we could not say anything until we notified the family first. 
However, I was instantly overcome with emotion and tears started to flow. As a member of the state commission, I was sitting up front with the other board members and I tried to hold things together. I did so just by wiping the tears away, but once I started sniffling, I knew I needed to leave the room. Folks, I can tell you that these tears were tears of joy. These were tears of excitement. Excitement not only for Ms. Taylor's family, but also excitement for her friends, co-workers, schoolmates, and anyone that she has ever crossed paths with. I was excited for the community because this is a beacon of hope for all those families that need closure too, he added. Cheryl's daughter, Justice Osby, had this to say after the arrest. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We never knew this day was coming. Justice said she is grateful to everyone who helped bring Turner to justice, and she is glad that she can finally have some closure. She said, I am just so thankful for everyone that participated and helped me get closure for my family, because today is a good day. On August 13th, 2014, a 13-year-old girl in Charlotte, North Carolina, told police that she had been assaulted by an unknown man. The incident took place along Shamrock Drive near East Way Drive. She was taken to a nearby hospital where evidence of an assault was collected. Repeatedly throughout the years, investigators would try and match the DNA of the perpetrator to a DNA profile they have in their databases. Recently, investigators with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department identified 33-year-old Trevon Levi Woods as the man responsible for assaulting the 13-year-old girl. The identification was made by matching DNA in the combined DNA index system. Woods was arrested for this crime on October 27, 2023. On the exact date of his arrest, Woods was leaving the Alexander Correctional Institute in Taylorsville after completing his sentence for unrelated charges. Police said they took Woods to the Mecklenburg County Detention Center and served him with his new warrants. A trial date has not been determined yet. 19-year-old Army Private Amanda Gonzalez was stationed on a U.S. Army base in Hanau, Germany in 2001. She was working as a battalion cook. When she failed to report for duty on November 5, 2001, soldiers broke down the door to her room to find her body on the floor of the barracks. She had been strangled and assaulted. Amanda was four months pregnant when her life was taken. Amanda grew up in Madisonville, Texas, and had many friends, her family said. In high school, she had a reputation for being caring and sticking up for her fellow classmates if they were bullied. In 2000, she surprised her family by showing up at their home with a recruiter to tell them she was joining the army. She planned to use her GI Bill to pay for college and become a physical therapist for children. That same reputation of caring for others earned her the nickname Firecracker when she joined the military. If she saw someone being mistreated, she would step in between and just go off. Amanda's case was investigated, but unfortunately, no suspect could be identified. For 21 agonizing years, her family has been asking questions and getting no answers as investigators made no arrests. Amanda's mother, Gloria Bates, said, It was just the same call. Every once a week, I would get a call. Answer it. Nothing new. Saying it was the same story. It was like a recording. Every time we come visit her gravesite, I tell her I am not giving up. I am not giving 
up. Gloria and her husband, Michael Bates, spent years writing to lawmakers and shows like Dr. Phil and America's Most Wanted. The break in the case finally came in 2023. The Justice Department named 42-year-old Shannon L. Wilkerson, a former Armed Forces member, as the man responsible for what happened to Amanda Gonzalez. Wilkerson was arrested in Florida on February 23, 2023. He faces a maximum sentence of life in prison if convicted. He entered a not guilty plea. Officials said that Wilkerson was an active duty soldier in 2001 and was later discharged. According to the brief indictment against Wilkerson, the suspect was discharged from the U.S. Army on July 31, 2004, and was discharged from the U.S. Army Reserve on June 12, 2007. Former FBI agent Brad Garrett said, There is no statute of limitations for the crime of taking a life. To charge somebody in federal court with this specific crime, you have to have a fair amount of information and evidence to show that you could win this case in a trial. The arrest marked the next chapter in the investigation that lasted longer than Amanda lived and came not a moment too soon. Amanda's cousin, Diane Lucio, said, She still instilled that fighting spirit because she was a fighter, and it allowed all of us to keep going for her and to never give up. Amanda's mother, Gloria, said, We have to continue on and fight for them because they cannot fight for themselves. They do not have a voice. You are their voice. Amanda's stepfather, Michael Bates, said, He hopes the tragedy his family suffered can improve the conditions for female soldiers. Unfortunately, a motive for the crime has not been given. Investigators also did not elaborate on what led them to Shannon L. Wilkerson. Sixteen-year-old Pamela Lynn Conyers lived in Baltimore, Maryland in 1970. She attended Glen Burnie High School. On the evening of October 16, 1970, Pamela attended a high school pep rally and then drove to the Harrendale Plaza Mall at around 8.30 p.m. Pamela never returned home from running her errands, and her family reported her missing. Four days later, authorities discovered her body in a wooded area. Her body was found between the eastbound and westbound lanes of Maryland Route 177, extending into Millersville, Maryland, she had been strangled and assaulted. Nearby, between Mountain Road and Route 100, they found the family car that she had been driving. Nothing in the car indicated where Pamela was or what had happened to her. When investigators collected evidence from the crime scene, they had no idea how it would later be used. The case was investigated using traditional methods, but unfortunately, a suspect could not be identified and the case went cold. Finally, on March 10, 2023, law enforcement officials from the Anne Arundel County Police Department announced that they finally solved Pamela's case. They identified Forrest Clyde Williams III as the man responsible. He was identified using DNA technology and genetics research. Frustratingly, he passed away in 2018 of natural causes. Anne Arundel County police officials said there was no evidence to suggest Pamela knew Williams. Federal and local officials praised detectives for pursuing a decades-long search for justice in the case. FBI agent Tom Sobachinsky said, We are pleased to deliver a measure of justice for Pamela Conyers and her loved ones. Cases may grow cold, investigators may change, but this proves that for law enforcement, 
victims are never forgotten. Detectives use DNA analysis and a process called investigative genetic genealogy, neither of which existed when Pamela's life was ended in 1970, Sobaczynski said. Cold case detectives recently developed a DNA profile that they compared to information available in publicly accessible genealogical databases. That allowed them to identify potential relatives of the suspect, create a family tree, and ultimately pinpoint Williams. Sobaczynski declined to specify which relatives led them to Williams or describe the process in detail. He did say that the case demonstrates how evolving technology allows law enforcement to solve cold cases, a process that has given hope where previously there may have been none. Such genealogical investigations have revolutionized cold case investigations across the country in recent years. Though privacy advocates have expressed concern about the implications of law enforcement accessing public genealogy databases. Anne Arundel County officials provided little information about Williams, saying only that he had a sparse criminal history and spent most of his life in Virginia. He was 21 years old back in 1970. His family moved to Maryland when Williams was a teenager, and he attended an Anne Arundel County High School. He moved back to Virginia sometime later. Police presented an old mugshot of Williams from the early 1970s, saying he was arrested locally on minor counts, including drunk and disorderly conduct. Williams was survived by two children and many other relatives, according to his obituary. Anne Arundel County Police Chief Amal Awad said during the news conference that if Williams was still alive, he would have been charged with taking the life of Pamela Conyers. She was quite simply doing what most 16-year-old high school students did back then, living her life, creating memories, and spending precious moments with her family and friends. Simply celebrating and enjoying the essence of her teen years until her life was tragically and selfishly taken. Pamela was never forgotten, nor will she ever be forgotten, the chief added. Michael Golden, a high school classmate of Pamela, said the announcement brought some sense of closure, but also raised more questions. Golden attended the news conference with his high school yearbook in hand, opening it to a photo of Pamela. It is still frustrating because I do not know anything about this guy, he said of the suspect. It is something all of our classmates have been grappling with for all these years. Golden, who befriended Pamela during band practice, said he vividly remembers when she went missing. He recalled an image of her empty desk in trigonometry class the Monday morning after her disappearance. I still mourn her, he said. I got to grow old, and she did not. She is forever 16. David Wells, another longtime community member whose wife went to school with Pamela, said he was serving in the Air Force when the case was unfolding. He recalled being stationed in Hawaii and receiving letters from family members about the tragedy back home. Officials said detectives do not believe Pamela's case is connected to the slaying of Catherine Ann Sesnick, a Baltimore nun who went missing from a local shopping center. Her body was later found. She suffered blunt force trauma. That case was featured in a 2017 Netflix documentary, The Keepers. Law enforcement said Pamela's family were notified of the development and requested privacy. Forty-three-year-old Eric Shears lived in Houston, Texas in 2013. He was a father, family man, and friend to many. Eric was described as funny and witty. He loved to cook, and he loved to have family functions. 
When family members had not heard from him for a few days in January 2013, his uncle, Curtis Anderson, decided to go take a look. Curtis went to Eric's West Houston apartment on Fountain View Drive and made a gruesome discovery. Eric had been stabbed numerous times. Investigators collected forensic evidence from the crime scene and started the investigation. Family members told police that Eric had told them about a potential boyfriend, but unfortunately, they did not know who this man was. Leads dried up and the case went cold. Recently, Houston police reviewed the case and conducted DNA testing on evidence that was collected back in 2013. Results from the DNA tests indicated that Raymond Lincoln was responsible for taking Eric's life. Investigators found messages between the two men that implied a relationship. Lincoln was then interviewed. He confessed to the crime. He claimed Eric made unwanted advances, which led to a fight and struggle over a knife. The circumstances are extremely similar to those of a 1992 slaying for which Lincoln was convicted. The victim in that case was also a male, and Lincoln also claimed unwanted advances. 52-year-old Raymond Charles was officially charged with taking the life of Eric Shears on April 28, 2023. Detectives with the Houston Police Department called Eric's family to notify them of the development in the case. After such a long wait, his family is now ready for swift justice. Eric's uncle, Curtis Anderson, who made the discovery, said, He is living in his own hell. They are just going to put him in a cage now. Eric's cousin, Natasha Simmons, said, I always prayed about it. I always wondered, you know, hey, Lord, this can be possible. I love him and I miss him. I miss him very much. Lincoln is being held on a $150,000 bond for the charge against him. Police are asking anyone who may have information about other cases involving Lincoln to call detectives at 713-308-3600. Or Crime Stoppers at 713-222-TIPS. Sixteen-year-old Kimberly Lewisell lived in Livingston County, Michigan in 1982. She loved poetry and spending time with her sisters. On March 20th, 1982, Kimberly left her boyfriend's home and called her mom from a gas station payphone to tell her she was on her way home. She decided to hitchhike. It was something she had done before. She started in the area of Eight Mile and Inkster Roads. She got a ride to the area of Eight Mile and Merriman Roads in Livonia. At around 6.30 p.m., she made at least four phone calls trying to find a ride the rest of the way home. Sadly, Kimberly never made it back home, and she was not seen alive again. Her family searched for her, tracked down her friends, but could not find any trace of her. She was reported missing to the Green Oak Township Police Department the next day. Kimberly Lewisell's mother said police kept asking her about her daughter being a runaway. She was not a runaway. She was on her way home. She said she was on her way home, Joanna Lewisell said. The days turned into weeks. Then her body was found. On April 14, 1982, Kimberly Lewisell's body was found behind a park and ride in the Island Lake Recreation Area near Grand River Avenue and Kensington Road, just five miles from her home. She had been assaulted, beaten, and strangled. Her personal belongings were not located. An autopsy revealed that even though she had been missing for more than three weeks, she lost her life four or five days before being found. 
Investigators with the Green Oak Township Police Department exhausted all leads before the case went cold. Kimberly's sister, Cindy Authors, dedicated herself to helping track down the perpetrator. About 15 years ago, I had just started Googling her name to see if I could find anything on her, and I found two really, really old articles that did not have the right information, Cindy Authors said. That kind of upset me that I could not find any information on it. It was like she just did not exist. So that was where I started because I wanted to correct the wrong information, and then it just went from there. Cindy Authors started a Facebook page to share information about the case, posted flyers, and tracked down her sister's friends. She became a pseudo-detective. Kimberly's case got a new set of eyes recently when Michigan State University students taking part in a cold case internship with Michigan State Police took interest. The students sifted through boxes of evidence and files, and there was a name that caught their eye, Charles David Shaw. Back in 1983, someone had tipped police that Shaw had lived in the area where Kimberly Lewisell lived. They said he had recently destroyed his apartment, and they thought it was suspicious. Police took note, but never tracked Shaw down. That was interesting, because in early 2023, Livingston County cold case investigators announced Shaw as the suspect in the 1983 slaying of 19-year-old Christina Casteglioni. Christina lived with her mother and father in Redford Township at the time of her disappearance. She was last seen between 7.30 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. on March 19, 1983, walking westbound on Five Mile Road near Lola Park in Redford Township. Her mother reported her missing on March 21, 1983. Her body was found on March 29, 1983 in the Oak Grove State Game Area on Fawcett Road in Deerfield Township. Police were able to obtain DNA from Christina's body. In March 2022, investigators applied and received grant funding through Season of Justice, a nonprofit organization dedicated to funding DNA testing on unsolved cold cases. In May 2022, the DNA evidence was sent to Othram Lab in Texas, the company behind DNA Solves. Othram used the genealogical profile to identify leads in the case and turned that evidence over to investigators. Investigators said through that work in cooperation from the suspect's family, they were able to identify beyond a reasonable doubt who the perpetrator was. The cooperation of the Shaw family during the investigation was paramount to identifying Charles Shaw as the person responsible for what had happened to Christina Castiglione, Livingston County investigators said in a press release. Investigators then began focusing on Shaw as a suspect in Kimberly Lewisell's case. They created maps of areas where he was known to spend time, like where he lived and where he worked, and they discovered that those locations surrounded Kimberly's location. Investigators did a property audit on all the property and all the evidence that they had in the case. The students and detectives took that evidence to the Michigan State Police Crime Lab and asked for it to be retested. They were hoping for a miracle. Then, four months later, they got a hit. DNA was found on one of the items that had been collected from the crime scene. The DNA had been among the evidence for 40 years and had gone unnoticed. The cell was uploaded into the system and linked to Shaw. The announcement came in September 2023. Investigators believe Shaw kidnapped Kimberly while she was walking. Police said they are 100% confident that Charles David Shaw 
is responsible for taking the life of Kimberly Lewisell. Shaw's body was found in Detroit on November 27, 1983. The medical examiner's report listed the cause as accidental asphyxiation. Unfortunately, there will then never really be justice. Shaw had several interactions with law enforcement beginning at a young age. One such interaction resulted in his arrest in 1981 for the attempted abduction of a woman in the Fowlerville McDonald's parking lot. Detectives are exploring the possibility that Shaw is responsible for additional crimes during the early 1970s until his end in November 1983. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Sergeant Larry Rothman of the Michigan State Police at 313-407-9379. Cindy Authors posted, Kim, I love you, I miss you, and I will never let you be forgotten. I kept my promise. It's over. She also posted a picture of herself and her parents and sister Kathy standing with Michigan State Police cold case detective Sergeant Larry Rothman. Her father is holding a picture of Kimberly. Thirty-seven-year-old Robin War Lawrence lived in Fairfax, Virginia in 1994. She was married to Ollie Lawrence. They had a two-year-old daughter together. Robin worked in the promotions department of Merchants Tire and Auto Centers. In November 1994, Ollie was out of the country on a work trip. He grew concerned when he was unable to reach Robin. He asked a family friend to check in on her. The family friend went to their home on November 20th, 1994 at 12.30 p.m and discovered a heinous and tragic scene. Robin Lawrence's body was found inside the house, located in the 8600 block of Resca Lane in Springfield, Massachusetts. She had been stabbed. Her daughter was left unharmed in another room. She was alone in the house over the weekend until her mother's body was discovered. Investigators were able to locate DNA belonging to the perpetrator at the crime scene. It was tested, but technology at the time was not advanced enough to find a match. In 2019, cold case detectives began working with Parabon Nanolabs, a company in Northern Virginia that specializes in DNA phenotyping and genetic genealogy analysis. The company worked to build a family tree to narrow down who the suspect could be. The company uses processes that predict physical appearance and biological relationships from unidentified DNA evidence. For three years, detectives used the family tree to try to put things together, and ultimately they were led to 51-year-old Stephen Smirk of Niskayuna, New York. Once Smirk was identified, police used digital composite sketches from Parabon to estimate what Smirk may have looked like at the time of the crime. That image was compared to photos of Smirk as a younger man. Detectives traveled to New York, spoke to Smirk, and collected a DNA sample. The detectives also left a business card with Smirk. When they returned to their hotel, he called and confessed to the crime. Stephen Smirk said that he is ready to talk. He then went to the local police station and turned himself in. Detectives then had a conversation with him where Smirk confessed to and fully described his slaying and robbing of Robin Lawrence. In September 2023, a news conference was held by the Fairfax County Police Department. They announced that Stephen Smirk had been taken into custody and that he was charged with taking Robin's life. Eli Corey, Deputy Chief of Investigations, said that the crime was a randomly selected act with no connection between Smirk and Robin. 
It was also noted that Smirk has no criminal history and that this is the first time he was ever arrested. Corey said that Smirk will be extradited from New York to Virginia. He also said that Smirk is not a person of interest or suspect in any other crimes that the department is aware of. Smirk, who is now married with two children, was serving as an active duty member of the Army at the time that the crime occurred. After almost 30 years of work, Smirk is behind bars and he is going to be held accountable for his actions, Corey said. Members of Lawrence's family, including her surviving daughter, attended the news conference but did not take any questions. Robin's husband, Ollie Lawrence, did later state that he was flabbergasted to hear a suspect had been arrested. You could have probably knocked me over with a feather, Ollie said. After all of this time, you have hope, but you also wonder, will they really find someone after 29 years? Welcome back to the new broadcast on 24 Hours Channel. First and foremost, we would like to extend our greeting and well wishes to all our value listeners who have always accompanied and supported along with our editorial team. We look forward to receiving your feedback and suggestion which will further motivate us to deliver the best and most accurate information of the latest developments in the pandemic situation, national and international news, and the hottest story of the past 24 hours. And now it's time for today's new update for you.